Okay, so I want to dive a little bit deeper into Saturn's rings and kind of map them out a little bit and give you a little bit of context for their size. So their total width is about 70,000 kilometers, um, but their thickness is only about 20 meters. And the total mass is the mass of a small moon. So these, um, these factors explain a couple of different things. First of all, they suggest that maybe it could be that these rings are made of a destroyed moon. They have about the right mass as Saturn's moons. Um, and this other factor about their size explains why sometimes when we're seeing it edge on, it appears that the rings completely disappear. 20 meters is very, very thin compared to the you know, size of the entire planet. So from a distance, that doesn't look like anything at all. Um, and so that's why Galileo would have been so confused uh, because this very thin ring system appears to completely disappear and is not visible through a telescope. Okay, so if we look at the structure of the ring system, these are named by letter, kind of boring, in the order that they were discovered. So the A ring and the B ring are these two brightest rings. Um, these are separated by what's called the Cassini division. So this is a gap in ring material where there are some um, more tenuous bits of ring, but it's um, not as densely packed as either the A or the B ring. The A ring also has a gap in it. This is called the Enki gap. And then the C ring is uh, toward the interior of the planet and it's much more tenuous and you know, almost transparent. Uh, there are other rings, D, E, and F outside of the A ring, and E is associated with Enceladus, as we'll talk about here. So um, Enceladus, as we know, is a icy uh, moon with a subsurface liquid ocean, so it appears, and it is um, sending geysers out into space. And I don't think I mentioned this before to this class, but the the geysers are concentrated along the south pole of Enceladus. And so we thought that it might be the case that that's the only place where there's geological activity on Enceladus. But recent measurements have shown that there's actually um, some infrared um, heat signatures around the North Pole as well. And so that might be a geologically active place and perhaps we can um, expect to find more geysers there uh, going forward. So anyway, all of the water that is pumped out into space by Enceladus uh, gets uh, wrapped into a ring around Saturn. So this is an image uh, by, I believe by Cassini, of Enceladus spewing out material to create Saturn's E-ring. And because this is not the same as the rest of the rings, it's not a collection of, you know, icy particles with a wide range of sizes, um, it has a different shape. So instead of being a flat kind of, you know, CD shape, it's instead a donut shaped ring. Okay. And the width of this particular ring is pretty vast. So it starts at around 75,000 kilometers above Saturn's atmosphere and extends almost 200,000 kilometers farther than that. Okay, and you can really see looking at this image, the scale of the E-ring compared to the scale of the main rings of Saturn. All right, so um, thinking about the gaps of Saturn's rings in a little bit more detail, why are there gaps? Okay, I'm seeing mostly votes for D and that's right. So that means both A and B are correct. Um, B, some gaps are cleared out by small moons that orbit within those gaps. So if you have a moon orbiting within the gaps, some of the ring particles can stick to the moon and eventually it will gather up all of, that, um, all of those ring particles in its orbital distance and there will be a gap. And then A, some gaps are at distances that are in resonance with one of Saturn's moons. So that means that if, it, if there's an orbital resonance, then every time, remember, uh, an object would you know, come so that they're in conjunction uh, near each other, then there could be a small gravitational tug. So if there's a orbital resonance with one of the, the Saturn's moons, then you'll get repeated regular tugs and serve to move the 
the particles away from that position of the resonance. So um, let's apply that idea. So here is a reminder of what an orbital resonance means. And those little flashes are different conjunctions. So let's say that we're looking at the Cassini division. And if you apply Kepler's laws to the Cassini division's location, then you get that the orbital period at that location for some object would be 11.3 hours. So then which one of these options would explain Cassini division? So I'm seeing the most votes for B, that the moon Mimas has an orbital period of 22.6 hours. And this would be in a two to one resonance with a 11.3 hour period. And so this would be an orbital resonance example. Um, the other ones are not an integer of 11.3. So none of those are an orbital resonance. So uh, because of this, the moon Mimas is responsible for keeping particles uh, pulled out of that Cassini division. All right. So um, that's an example, uh, well, sort of an example of the idea of a shepherd moon. So one of the ways that a moon can affect ring structure is just like that, by clearing out the orbit um, where it, the moon itself orbits, or by clearing out a gap, not where the moon orbits, but where it has an orbital resonance. And so there's another way that moons can affect ring structure, and that's by shepherding the rings. So they can keep the, if there are two moons on either side of a thin ring, they can stabilize the location of that ring um, from spreading out. Uh, where collisions between ring particles could cause rings to spread out, um, but shepherd moons tend to keep them, um, yeah, folded together tightly. Uh, I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say. Brain is not working well this morning. But okay, the rings in the F ring, for example, are stabilized by Prometheus and Pandora. Um, and they can, these moons can also, uh, I guess, gravitationally perturb the rings as they move past different sections of the ring. So since the you know, moons on the inside of the ring are orbiting faster, moons on the outside of the ring are orbiting slower, according to Kepler's laws, then as the uh, moons pass the location of the ring, they can cause ripples. So that's what you're seeing here is ripples in the ring caused by uh, the, the gravitational tug by this moon. Uh, more recent research suggests that it seems like both of these moons might not be involved with stabilizing the F-ring, which just goes to show that there's still a lot being learned about Saturn's ring system, um, especially because of all the you know, information and data we got from the Cassini mission. All right, so that's shepherd moons. Okay, so we've already mentioned that Saturn's rings are made mostly of ice, but that's a little bit of an oversimplification. And when we look at the, um, the data of, from the, I guess, reflectance of these rings, uh, that tells us about what the material is made of. And so when we look at the uh, composition and then uh, false color the rings by their composition, we notice that most of the rings are made of icy material, that's all the blue, uh, but these red materials represent regions where there's a high amount of dirt and dust. And this um, apparently occurs mainly in the gaps. So. Uh, why this is the case is still not completely well understood, but it's interesting to think of what the composition of the rings is in comparison to the composition of the moons, because that might tell us whether those rings formed in place or formed by uh, the result of tearing apart a moon. And what we see is that uh, most of Saturn's moons are icy, but some of Saturn's moons, particularly Phoebe, are more rocky than the rest. So Phoebe is about 50% rock compared to the 35% rocky material that other moons are made of. So it's interesting that perhaps, you know, some of the rings are made of one type of destroyed moon, while other parts of the ring might be made of other types of destroyed moons. So um, the, you know, the final word on the origin of these rings is still not completely understood, but looking more closely at, the, at composition like this uh, will hopefully help us understand that in the future. Okay, so um, I have a question for you, which is that some moons that we look at around Saturn are not spherical, but they're also not that like 
a classic potato shape, I guess, that many asteroids are. So they're not completely random. And a lot of them have this kind of uh, skirt around them, uh, which I think makes them look like ravioli. So my question for you is, can you think of any reasons why these moons would be ravioli shaped? Uh, this is a very open question. So take about a minute and think about that. Type it in the chat, I'll tell you in descend. Okay, cool, lots of good ideas here. So maybe they're too small for gravity to have made them round. Um, and perhaps they're, they have some bulging at the sides from a fast rotation causing a rotational flattening. Um, perhaps the moons that we see used to be a larger moon and were broken up into small moons with bizarre shapes. Um, and maybe some moonlets could be merging together as they orbit Saturn and that leads to kind of this uh, ravioli shape. And yeah, I think that's maybe pieces have broken off, not just from large collisions, but for small collisions with Saturn's wing particles. All of these are good ideas. Um, it's definitely true that they're not uh, massive enough for their own gravity to have caused them to become spherical. This is the case for all of the asteroids too, by the way. Um, so that's one factor, but then we would expect just random shapes and it doesn't necessarily uh, explain the ravioli. The ravioli shape is better explained by the fact that these moons all orbit within the ring system. And so they are effectively coated by pieces of ring. So parts of the ring particles stick to these moons and change their shapes over time. So these probably didn't start out ravioli shaped, but they became that way as they picked up little bits of ring material. So those are the ravioli moons, which I think is delightful. Okay, so that's Saturn's moons. And I haven't really talked about Jupiter, Neptune, and Uranus moons. And I was gonna have you do one more um, poster project on this, but I think I'm gonna skip this for now and come back to it near the end of class.